topic which we are going to discuss now are bronchodilators. What are these bronchodilators? Where are these used? And pathophysiology of the disease in which these bronchodilators are used will be discussed. Bronchodilators are the drugs which are used to cause dilation of the bronchial smooth muscle. The name itself indicates bronchodilators. The dilation of bronchial smooth muscle is done by these bronchodilators. So, when or where does bronchoconstriction takes place? So, bronchoconstriction usually occurs in a deceased condition called as asthma. So, let us see what is asthma. Asthma is a diseased condition or else it is a pulmonary disorder which causes bronchoconstriction or bronchospasm when the lung or when the lung tissue or bronchial muscle is exposed to ex extrinsic or intrinsic factors like viruses or like pyrogens or allergens. So if there are various extrinsic and intrinsic factors when which when exposed or when the lungs are exposed to these extrinsic or intrinsic factors it causes constriction of bronchial smooth muscle thereby asthma is occurred let us see the pathophysiology so the inducers like viruses as well as genes there are various genes as well as viruses or pyrogens or allergens these are inducers of asthma so when these pyrogens or allergens which when entered into the body it causes or it shows symptoms like cold infection in it in the sense it triggers constriction of bronchial smooth muscle so when this constriction of bronchial smooth muscle is observed it triggers cold and infectious conditions or if when a person is doing exercise then exercise also causes constriction of the air airways and thereby the asthma is observed what are the causes of asthma why this asthma is caused asthma is caused mainly due to the air pressure changes or temperature changes or fumes if a lot of fumes are there or if a person have the habit of smoking then if a person has the habit of sedentary lifestyle or because of the dust because of the food because of various other allergic reactions and because of the humidity where if a person is exposed to all these conditions then it leads to a deceased called as deceased condition called as asthma what are the symptoms? If a person, how we can see, say that if a person is suffering from asthma by seeing him. The symptoms observed are dyspnea, wheezing and cough. What is dyspnea? It is a condition where there occurs shortness of breath or else there will be breathlessness. There will be difficulty in breathing for a person. So if this is observed or if a person have wheezing, there will be a peculiar sound if a person have heavy cough or heavy cold that is called as wheezing and cough. Heavy cough or dry cough is observed then we can say that, that if, when these three symptoms are observed then we can say that the person is suffering from asthma. How, are, what, how we can diagnose the, that uh, the patient is suffering from asthma? What are the diagnosis tests? First thing is like chest x-ray or lung x-ray should be taken. If a person is suffering from asthma, then these two are the primary x-ray tests which are to be taken. The other one is a spirometry test. Spirometry test is a test which is conducted by a, by using an instrument called as a spirometer. So a spirometer is an instrument which contains two cylinders, inner cylinder and outer cylinder, where the inner cylinder contains a chain like ring which is attached to a ring which is having readings the outer cylinder consists of water in it so and it has a pipe through which a person blows the air so the reading where the the reading shows the vital capacity of the lungs and this is how much amount of air can be accumulated in the air so based on the readings of this pyrometer the we can say that the person is suffering from asthma or not and the other one is the probability of asthma. The person is prone to high probability as well as low probability. So what are the probability conditions of these asthma? High probability conditions. So if a person is having more symptoms of asthma like wheezing, cough as well as the dyspnea conditions if a person is having more symptoms then high there is high probability of asthma and exercise induced asthma if a person is doing heavy exercise for more period of time or for longer period of time then there are chances of 
getting high probability of asthma and so if a person is uh, using aspirin for longer time aspirin is an NSAID if a person is using aspirin for longer time then the symptoms or side effects of these asthma causes high probability of uh, sorry the symptoms of these aspirin causes high probability of asthma and family history if a person is having a hereditary of asthma if his ancestors or if his uh, elders are suffering from asthma then he has uh, the chances of getting asthma high probability of getting asthma and wheezing also the we over over wheezing conditions or over cough conditions or over symptomatic conditions also causes high probability of asthma so if a person is having high probability of asthma then a trial treatment can be given to that person before the diseased condition can be worsened what are the low probabilities of asthma? If a person is having a slight cough or dizziness or if he is having slight difficulty in breathing as well as if there is any voice disturbance, if there is any slight disturbance in the voice for a longer period of time or if he is having smoking, if he is having the habit of smoking or if he is suffering from cardiovascular disorders. So these all lead to low probability of asthma. If a person is prone to low probability of asthma, then investigation is done. Like if what are the chances of getting uh, the or what are the chances of the patient or the person suffering from asthma or the disease to be getting worsened. Let us see the types of asthma. There are four types of asthma. First type of asthma is the asthma with a known allergic condition. So if a person, there are few allergens present in the body or there are few external allergens also. So if a person is suffering from asthma with a particular type of allergen, for example, histamine or bradykinase, these are the allergens which are released in the body. So we can estimate the um, uh, or else we can diagnose that the person is suffering from asthma from a known allergen. The other one is the asthma which is caused because of the specific allergic conditions. Allergen is different from allergic conditions. So already if a person is having allergy or else allergic reactions in his body, then he has a more scope of getting asthma. So known allergic or a specific allergic condition is uh, can cause asthma as well as known allergen also can cause asthma and the other type of asthma is asthma which is caused because of COPD that is constructive co coronary obstructive pulmonary disorder if a person is suffering from COPD also he has more chances of getting asthma the other one is exercise induced asthma as we do exercise for longer period of time then we take more amount of oxygen or more amount of air intake is observed so at for a particular period of time if we intake more in ex if we intake more air in excessive amount then it causes spasm of that particular muscle and thereby the airway is obstructed Bronchodilators. What are these bronchodilators? Bronchodilators are the drugs which causes dilatation of the bronchial smooth muscle. So these are the drugs which are usually recommended in asthma which when administered to the patient it causes dilatation of the bronchial smooth muscle by various mechanisms. Let us see the classification of these bronchodilators. Bronchodilators are usually classified into three types. First one are anticholinergic drugs. The other one are sympathomimetics, the other one are xanthine derivatives and there are other class of drugs. I mean miscellaneous drugs are also present which are used in asthma. And these sympathomimetics are further classified into non-selective adrenergic drugs as well as selective beta-2 adrenergic drugs. Let us see this category of drugs in detail. The first class of drugs are xanthine derivatives or methyl xanthins. So these xanthine derivatives or methyl xanthins are basically plant alkaloids like caffeine, theophylline and theobromine. But in these plant alkaloids, theophylline is mainly used as a bronchodilator. And there are various other bronchodilators or methylxanthin bronchodilators like aminophilin, oxyphilin as well as theophylline and diphylline. So aminophilin, diphylline, oxtriphylin as well as theophylline. These are the major xanthine derivatives which are used as bronchodilators. Why these are considered as methyl xanthine in the sense because they have 1 and 5 methyl groups. They, they contain methyl groups in 1 and 5, uh, C1 and C5. That is the ca first carbon atom and fifth carbon atom are consisting of methyl groups in their structure. Let us see the mechanism of action of these methyl xanthins. Methyl xanthins act by inhibiting an enzyme called as phosphodiesterase. 
Phosphodiester is such an enzyme which converts cyclic AMP or cyclic GMP to GMP where it causes constriction of the bronchial smooth muscle. So this phosphodiester is enzyme when inhibited then the cyclic AMP levels will be reduced and whereby it causes release of NO that is NO is nitric oxide which causes dilatation of the smooth muscle. So it mainly acts by inhibiting the phosphodiesterase enzyme. What are the drug effects? What, what happens if methyl xanthans are taken? When methyl xanthans are taken, it is very simple. There occurs bronchodilatation or, or else dilatation of the or relaxation of the bronchial smooth muscle. But these methyl xanthans also exert their action by CNS stimulation. As we all know, Kefin will... If we take coffee or tea, then our brain works sharper because it contains caffeine. So these methyl xanthans act on CNS and thereby they cause a stimulation of the CNS nervous system or a central nervous system. What are the therapeutic uses of these methyl xanthans? Methyl xanthans are used in chronic asthmatic disorders. If a person is suffering from asthma for chronic chronically, then these methyl xanthans are used. And but they are not used in acute asthmatic agents. Initially, if a person is having or showing the symptoms of asthma, then these methyl xanthans are usually not recommended. And these methyl xanthans are also used in the prophylaxis treatment of COPD, that is coronary obstructive pulmonary disorders. What are the side effects of these methyl xanthans? So methyl xanthans have common side effects like nausea, vomiting as well as anorexia. Anorexia is a, such a condition where it causes loss of appetite and it causes gastroesophageal reflux also. When these methyl xanthans are taken in overdose then in sleep the gastrointestinal reflex in the sense the gastric contents will be refluxed or regurgitated into the esophagus or oral cavity. The other one is sinus tachycardia, extra systole, transient increase in urination. So there will be disturbances in the heartbeat as well as pores of contraction of the heart if when methyl xanthans are taken in larger dose and they, it causes increased or frequent urination. Let us see the next category of drugs of these bronchodilators. They are beta agonists. Beta agonists or sympathomimetics. There are three classes of these sympathomimetics. One is, one is non-selective adrenergic blockers. The other one is non-selective beta adrenergic blockers. The other one is selective beta 2 agonists. So adrenergic receptors. There are uh, four types of adrenergic uh, receptors. There are various types of adrenergic receptors actually. But basically these adrenergic receptors are classified into two types. That is alpha as well as beta. Alpha are further classified into alpha 1 and alpha 2 adrenergic receptors and beta are further classified into beta 1, beta 2 as well as beta 3 adrenergic receptors. They exert their action based on the location because these receptors represent in various parts of the body. So these non-adrenergic beta, uh, non-adrenergic uh, agonists are such a kind of sympathomimetics which act on beta as well as alpha receptors also. So such a drug is epinephrine. So epinephrine is a non-selective adrenergic blocker because uh, adrenergic agonist because it binds to both alpha as well as beta receptors and exerts its actions. And the other one is non-selective beta adrenergic. Non-selective beta adrenergic is isoproteinol. Isoproteinol only binds to beta receptors. It does not bind to alpha receptors. But it may bind to any of the three of these beta receptors. And selective beta 2 drugs. Selective beta 2 drugs like albuterol. Albuterol. So albuterol is such a drug which is which selectively binds to only beta 2 receptors and exerted actions. But there is a drug called as salbutamol. Salbutamol is also beta 2 adrenergic agonist but it is contraindicated in asthma because it have the action of potentiation of bronchoconstriction. It shows the action of constriction of bronchial muscle. So that is the reason salbutamol is the only beta 2 adrenergic drug which is contraindicated in asthmatic condition. Mechanism of action. The mechanism of action of these beta 2 agonists is very simple. These adrenergic receptors or sympathomimetics, they bind to the receptors like alpha, beta, 
beta based on the their selectivity they bind to their particular adrenergic receptors and they show the action of bronco uh, bronco dilation and thereby the dilation of the bronchial smooth muscle or they show vasodilation also so based on the receptors to which they bind they exert their action the ultimate result is bronco dilation what are the therapeutic uses of these beta 2 agonists or beta adrenergic drugs? So beta adrenergic drugs have various uses like they are used in hypertension, they are used in uh, shock treatment, they are used in the treatment of shock as well as they are used as bronchodilators in the sense they prevent bronchodilation or they give really relief to the bronchial smooth muscle and they are used to produce uterine relaxation also. They are used in the relaxation of uterine muscles also and they have a therapeutic use called as hyperkalemia they allow the entry of potassium into the muscle where the excessive amount of potassium is observed in the uh, kidney walls or else uh, nephron walls what are the side effects of these beta adrenergic blockers so alpha and beta adrenergic non-selective adrenergic uh, uh, non-selective adrenergic agonists have particular side effects like insomnia, restlessness, anorexia as well as cardiac stimulation and vascular headache. So anorexia is a condition where loss of appetite is observed and insomnia is a condition where sleeplessness is observed. And beta 1, selective beta 1 oral selective beta adrenergic agonists have side effects like cardiac stimulation, tremor, anginal pain as well as vascular headache so cardiac stimulation over stimulation of cardiac muscle is observed and tremors that is fits or it is also called as epilepsy condition and it also have a side effect called as anginal pain if when used in excessive amount it causes chest pain or it leads to a condition called as angina and the selective beta 2 adrenergic agonist have particular side effects like tremor, vascular headache and hypotension. If these, used, if these drugs are used in excessive condition, it causes or it uh, shows over dilatation of vascular smooth muscle. Thereby it causes, it leads to a condition called as hypotension. The other class of drugs are anticholinergics. Anticholinergics are the drugs which block the action of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is one of the major neurotransmitter which binds to the cholinergic receptors and exerts its actions. So cholino and ACH that is acetylcholine, ACH has various actions like it causes smooth muscle constriction, it causes eyes eyes i mean vascular dilatation it causes bronchial uh, constriction as well as it have various other actions also depends up, or upon the uh, organ which which is present or depending upon the receptor to which it is binding it shows its action and so there is only one anticholinergic drug which is used as bronchodilator that is ipratropium bromide. So ipratropium bromide is the anticholinergic drug which replaces the acetylcholine or which shows the adverse uh, agon uh, sorry antagonize the actions of the acetylcholine and shows bronchodilation effect. And, but the action of this ipratropium bromide is slow which when when ipratropium bromide is administered in the body it has slow and prolonged action the onset of action is very high but the action of this duration of action of this ipratropium bromide is also high and it is used to prevent bronchoconstriction the, if we can see this mechanism of action that is synaptic nase or a synaptic circle where the acetylcholine is released from the neuron. When neuron releases acetylcholine into the synaptic nase or synapse interval, there we can see the acetylcholine receptors. This acetylcholine bind to those receptors and exert its actions. But ipratropium bromide, it prevents the acetylcholine to bind to the receptors and thereby it shows bronchodilation. What are the side effects of these anticholinergics? All, mostly all of the anticholinergics have the common side effect called as dry mouth. So when these anticholinergic ad, uh, cholinergics are administered in overdose, it causes dryness of the mouth, it causes gastrointestinal distress, it shows common side effects like headache, coughing as well as anxiety. But there are no known drug interactions are observed. So this is the useful point of these anticholinergics. 
The other class of drugs are anti-leukotrienes. Anti-leukotrienes, corticosteroids as well as mast cell stabilizers. These are the drugs which are used in miscellaneous category. So anti-leukotrienes. Anti-leukotrienes are the type of drugs which are used to antagonize the leukotriene receptor action. So these leukotrienes bind to the leukotriene receptors and exert it actions. So these uh, leukotriene receptor antagonists or anti-leukotrienes, they prevent the leukotriene to bind the receptors and exert its actions. So mainly currently three drugs are used. That is Mon Mon Montelukast, Zafirlukast and Zalutin. The mechanism of action. These leukotrienes bind to the leukotriene receptors which are the type of PPAR receptor. These are the type of receptors where leukotrienes bind to those and exert its action. So they, these leukotriene receptor antagonists, they prevent the binding of these leukotrienes to those particular receptor and exert its action thereby preventing bronchoconstriction. What are the drug effects? What are the effects of these leukotrienes? First thing is like they prevent the smooth muscle contraction, they decrease mucus secretion. So in asthma, excessive mucus is secreted whereby it causes narrowing of the bronchial smooth muscle. So this over mucus secretion is decreased as well as bronchoconstriction is prevented as well as it prevents vascular permeability. Over permeation of these electrolytes, water or other whatever the ions which are present in the body, the over vascular permeability is prevented by these leukotriene receptor antagonists. Now what are the therapeutic uses of these leukotriene receptor antagonists? These are mainly used in chronic asthma but these are not recommended for acute asthmatic conditions. And Montelukast is a anti-leukotriene which is recommended for the children which is recommended for the children in the at the age of 2 or above. What are the side effects of these leukotriene receptor antagonists? So it has various side effects. Zyudin has side effects like headache, dyspepsia, nausea, dizziness, insomnia and liver function. So dyspepsia is a condition where stomach upset is observed and insomnia is, as I told you it is sleeplessness and zephyr locust have common side effects like dizziness, nausea, diarrhea, liver function as well as severe headache. And when compared to these two drugs, Montelukast have very few side effects. That is common side effects like headache and nausea can be observed with Montelukast. Corticosteroids. Corticosteroids are other miscellaneous class of drugs which are anti-inflammatory agents. These act as anti-inflammatory agents and they are used in chronic asthmatic conditions. These are also not recommended for acute asthmatic conditions and these corticosteroids are marketed or else they are available in the market in the form of oral as well as inhaled doses. So oral corticosteroids are also available as well as inhaled corticosteroids are available. But inhaled corticosteroids show more or beneficial effects when compared to oral corticosteroids. The mechanism of action, these oral corticosteroids, they stabilize the membranes of the cells. See, the, there are few membranes or else there are allergens which are present in the body. Histamine, bradykinin are examples of these allergens or chemical mediators which are released by the membranes in the body. So, these corticosteroids, they stabilize these allergens and thereby preventing the constriction of the bronchial smooth muscle in the body leading to the bronchodilation. Inhaled corticosteroids, the, what are the, as inhaled corticosteroids are more preferable than oral corticosteroids, the inhaled corticosteroids which are available in the market are beclomethazone and the other one is dexamethazone and funisolide. Flunisolide, dexamethazone, beclomethazone and triamcinolone. These are the inhaled corticosteroids which are available in the marketed formulation. The therapeutic uses, what are the therapeutic uses of these corticosteroids? The ultimate therapeutic uses of these corticosteroids are bronchospasm prevention or else it causes bronchodilation. There are various other uh, effects, so there, are, there are various other uses of these bron uh, corticosteroids also. But these are mainly recommended for asthmatic conditions or respiratory disorders. But these are not used as first line drugs for asthma because xanthan derivatives or methyl xanthans are used as first line drugs for asthma conditions.
what are the side effects of these corticosteroids these corticosteroids show common side effects like cough dry mouth these are the co common side effects with o uh, these oral corticosteroids or inhaled corticosteroids but it causes the special side effects of these corticosteroids are pharyngeal irritation it causes irritation in the pharynx or windpipe the other one is oral fungal infections if a uh, Oral corticosteroid is taken sometimes it may lead to or if it is taken in excessive dose it causes fungal infection in the oral cavity. The last class of these miscellaneous drugs of bronchodilators are mast cell stabilizers. There are only two types of drugs which are uh, present in mast cell stabilizers that is chromolin and uh, chromolin and nidochromil. So chromolin and nidochromil are the two mast cell stabilizer drugs which are used as bronchodilators. So the mechanism of these mast cell stabilizers are these mast cell stabilizers they block the calcium channels which allow or which allow the entry of these allergens into the body. So if a allergen like histamine if it has to enter into the body or blood circulation it has to pass through the membrane through the calcium channel when this calcium channel is blocked then the release of histamine into the blood circulation is prevented thereby it is stabilizing the cell membrane so that is the reason these mast cell stabilizers are used and the histamines or chemical mediators or allergens are released from mast cells which are present in the body so they prevent the release of these allergens from the mast cell membrane into the systemic circulation what are the therapeutic uses of these master cell stabilizers? They are mainly useful in the COPD, that is constructive coronary obstructive pulmonary disorder, and they are not recommended for acute asthmatic conditions. These master cell stabilizers are also given for long term treatment of asthma but they are not used in acute attacks of asthma and they are also given or they are also recommended in exercise induced bron bronchospasm if a person is suffering from bronchospasm because of the exercise conditions then these master cell stabilizers are also used and if a person is having bronchospasm because of allergens like or else if a person is having bronchospasm because of the pyrogens caused because of cold or fever or air obstruction then also these mast cell stabilizers are recommended what are the side effects of these mast cell stabilizers it has common side effects like cough dizziness headache cough dizziness headache are mainly the common side effects but there are rare side effects like sore throat we, there will be some kind of throat infection and rhinitis. Rhinitis is a condition where inflammation of mucous membrane of nose is observed. If a person is taking these mast cell stabilizers for longer period of time, then there occurs inflammation of the mucous membrane of the nose and it causes bronchospasm. Also, these mast cell stabilizers are taken in longer dose, then it causes bronchospasm in spite of bronchodilation.